Welcome to Oath Keepers Now. I'm your host, Mike Chisholm. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Actually, just one today. Uh, <clears throat> I have a special guest with me today. Uh, I'll introduce you to him in a second. Uh, I just want to continue to remind everyone out there about the class called The Making of America. And that's held every Friday at 1 o'clock at 150 North Main. That's in Old, po Old Town Pocatello. It's run by a gentleman named Ron Clayson. Excellent, excellent uh, tutor, excellent instructor. Uh, but without further ado, I have a special guest with me today from the John Birch Society. Uh, gentleman named Bliss Two. Thank you for being here, sir. Thanks for having here. me as a guest. Well, I appreciate you showing up. I know you're a very busy man. <laughs> well, we've, we've got quite a few meetings we're doing this week. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're traveling all over eastern Idaho and kind of over into central Idaho. So be a be a good busy week like you say mm -hmm. well it's been a busy year for everyone out there hasn't it um, let's talk about agenda 21 which is on a lot of people's mind today it's on my mind it's on everybody's mind of many things going on tell me a little bit more or let's get into agenda 21 sure well it's been a concern of the John Birch Society for many 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 years uh, we started noticing back in the 1970s that there was a global environmental agenda and of course like any intelligent human being members of the John Birch Society uh, care about having clean water and clean air and you know we're we're concerned about our environment and making sure that it's um, not destroyed irresponsibly and that kind of thing but we started to notice that the concerns that people had the fires were being stoked way back then all of a sudden we noticed a uh, barrage of environmental dangers suddenly put out over the uh, establishment media to frighten people we we went from a period in the early 70s if you remember where scientists were claiming that we were going to have a global ice age I to that. suddenly <laughs> we went to global warming ozone holes deforestation overpopulation um, you know we had uh, acid rain and uh, a loss of clean water and there was just a host suddenly of environmental challenges to the world that were brought out by the media by scientists so on and we we had uh, been aware of a book uh, 1967 I think it was um, report from Iron Mountain which had detailed it was uh, a report that appeared to be a government report um, that was put out um, without the person that put it out giving their name so they didn't want to be known but the report was very genuine in its uh, undertakings and it was talking about what do we do to replace war as an impetus to keep big government going so what do we have to supply and one of the things suggested in the book were you know vast environmental concerns and if we could create these vast concerns for people then that would excuse empowering government further and building more government so we were looking for that where's that going to come about there was also a 1961 report that was a state department report and i, I know i'm getting a little bit no that's okay that's behind. okay <laughs> this one was called um uh let's see the world effectively controlled by the United Nations and it was authored by uh, Professor Lincoln P Bloomfield of MIT he was uh, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and, and it was a fairly thick report uh, I don't know 20 something pages probably and it also talks about how do you empower the United Nations to become as he said unblushingly a world government how do you do that? So they talked about backing off the communist dynamic so that it could be more easily merged with the West under a world government, under the United Nations, and maybe even changing the UN Charter to uh, be something different that could be um, a stronger document and that the UN could be strengthened. So there was, uh, you know, talk in that report about having some challenges that rise to the level of war but aren't necessarily war that frighten mankind so that mankind can be herded into this new world order this global government well, let's fast forward a little bit 1970 uh, as the media and 
various politicians began to trumpet all of these environmental challenges I just mentioned, like the new idea that we've got global warming caused by mankind, anthropogenic global warming, and this idea that now there's ozone holes and it's because of chlorofluorocarbons. That's that a spray, right? That yeah. men have released with no, their underarm spray. deodorants <laughs> and so on. And, uh, and we've got uh, deforestation and acid rain and overpopulation that's going to completely cover the world. There won't be an inch of space left for animals and plant life to breathe because mankind will have plowed it all underneath freeways and so on. And so there were all of these concerns being trumpeted and that was when we had the very first Earth Day, 1970. And so, you know, the, the kind of the peace generation or uh, some call it the hippie, flower, the hippie flower, influence the flower and the children. flower children <laughs> and all that, picked up this new uh, concern of Mother Nature and songs came out, look at Mother Nature on the run in the 1970s, Neil, Born Young, free. Neil Young was singing. Born and, so free. and as we moved into all that, then we started to see uh, organization at the United Nations being formed to consider our global environment. And, uh, and that was kind of the beginnings of it. And let's fast forward again to 1992. In 1992, the John Birch Society sent our investigative reporter, William F. Jasper, to uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, for what was billed as the Earth Summit. UNSED, that was the uh, United Nations Conference uh, on environment and development. And about 35,000 government officials, diplomats, environmentalists, UN partisans, and journalists showed up at the Earth Summit down in Rio de Janeiro. Sounds like a big summit. It was a, it was a big deal. <laughs> it was big. And, and out of that summit came a number of reports, and they purported to be products of the summit itself, as though these 35,000 people got together and, and in some brilliant flash of genius, they organized these reports and somehow they were printed and you know, collated and printed and binded. And, and so they all had an epiphany is what you're yeah, saying. they were bound and <laughs> yeah. And it was all done because of this gathering. But really, you know, the reports had been created before the summit so that they were prepared or naturally they couldn't have been printed and bound and handed out at the summit. It's, <laughs> you know, that's very interesting. You know, you know, it's amazing how things kind of fall into place, guys out there, you know, how things just fall into place. So but we were <coughs> supposed to think that this was global democracy at work when really it was the think tanks and, and uh, uh, elitists that had put together these reports prior to the summit to foist upon the world. Well, one of the reports, and the key report, the one most important and that I meant to bring with me today and left it on my desk, was the Agenda 21 report. And I, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. I've got a little tiny picture of it right here. Agenda 21. No, right there in the camera. Huh? Okay, I'll put it over there. <laughs> this is it right here. But anyway, Agenda 21, it was over a thousand pages in its original form, and uh, sounds like pages. Yeah, sounds like the uh, health care bill. Yes. Yeah, well, that, yeah, that was always, 2,800 pages, I think. You know, you've heard of too big to fail. This is too big to read. Too, too big to read. <laughs> you know, but I like anyway, that too big to read. <laughs> yeah, it's like you know, most people aren't going to crack that. No. Now, Daniel Cetera, as a, an environmental lawyer, later on put out a a. a uh, shortened version of Agenda 21 so that people would read it. It's about 300 pages. That's the one I bought and I've been plowing through. Um, Is it still like where you need a, a degree? Most most of these things you need a degree in, in, in law, I guess. To just read it, then you probably get through about half of it. Actually, this one, you know, I, I don't know about the 1,000 page version because I have not read that. But the 300 page version, you can it's quite plain for the most part in its language. You can understand. And in the first few chapters, the thing that struck me the most is how often the word must appears. You know, as in people must do this, and businesses must do that, and governments must do this. And that's know, authoritative. It sounds it like a very, very authoritative, authoritative yeah. and commanding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the difference in our government structure created by the United Nations, I mean, created by the uh, U.S. Constitution is that this is law that is law upon the government trying to 
hold government to just a few delegated powers and assignments and tasks, period. I tell people the Constitution, what, what you were saying, the Constitution out there holds people in check, holds our government in check. Right. Checks and balance. But a lot of yeah. people think, oh no, it's not. It's not. Well, the Constitution is about the government. It doesn't give us. <laughs> That's right. It's not. It's not a law upon the people. It's a law upon the government. Whereas the UN Charter is all about expanding the power of government and building on it and g growing that kind of power to control people. They're they're two completely different things. Well, that's what you get from Agenda 21. Is it's a document about people control, control of all the populations of Earth. And uh, so this was one of the products of the Earth Summit in 1992. And William F. Jasper brought that back from the Earth Summit, wrote some articles about it, warned us about it. And the John Birch Society, through our publications, both books and uh, our magazine, began to trumpet that people needed to pay attention to the new Earth Summit's production of Agenda 21 that would be something that would become law upon us. A, a year later, there was another document, uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity, that came out, and Bill Clinton signed that one. Now, George Herbert Walker Bush, President of the United States back in 1992, signed on to the, to the Earth Summit's Agenda 21. Bill Clinton was President when this Biological Diversity Convention came out, and he signed on to that. <clears throat> and it created a new process that was called the Wildlands Project. And the Wildlands Project was had as an idea to rewild America, to return us to the 1492 state it was in before Columbus came. Not really keeping in mind that you know North America was covered with Indian tribes, so people were here, we are part of the environment. Yes. But you know, it wants to pretend like it was barren of people. And so this is their part of their plan summed up in a map. And, uh, can I see that map? Yeah, this is kind of the Wildlands Project, and you can see that the UN would like to create enclaves for people where they're allowed to live, and that the rest of it becomes um, kind of off limits to people and to people's activities, that we have all kinds of uh, zones. For instance, the core reserves and corridors that have little or no human use are the red areas. Maybe they show up as pink here, kind of, but red. If you look at the yellow areas, those are buffer zones that are highly regulated use. <clears throat> the blue areas are normal use zones. You won't see a lot of blue on the map comparatively. But isn't that uh, Lake Michigan? And, and <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's true, too. I mean the light blue zones, the, the water, yeah. That's, yeah, I was saying blue. Uh, this but, is quite disturbing. Yeah. Well, it should be. Uh, I, I think, you know, what they're looking at here is the movement of populations and, and bringing us back into cities and out of the country and making us more dependent and less independent as human beings. Um, Isn't that what Pol Pot did? Oh, he everybody out. Yeah, he did the op opposite. He everybody out. Yeah, he did the opposite. He herded everybody out of the cities mm -hmm. and into the country and said, okay, grow rice now without tools and without training and without preparation. Millions died. Oh, millions. A third of the Cambodian population died. Mm -hmm. and there was a great book on that, 1975, called um, Murder of a Gentle Land. Uh, I think Reader's Digest put it out. Um, but at any rate, so we have this Wildlands Project, and there's a whole bunch of other documents that then start to come into play. Uh, 1993, President Clinton established the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And sustainable development was a catchword that came out of uh, the 1987 Brundtland Commission. Uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland was the uh, Vice President of Socialist International. She had been uh, the um, Secretary General over the World Health Organization for the United Nations, and she introduced the term sustainable development. This is what uh, sustainable development says in her report. There's a definition. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. That doesn't sound too bad. But as you get into the Earth Summit, you start to realize that uh, 
what they're talking about is changing our energy use patterns, changing our consumption patterns, changing our travel patterns, changing our patterns of population growth, reducing population through various methods. So let me read you another quote. Marie Strong was the Secretary General of the United Nations Earth Summit in 1992. That was in Rio de Janeiro, right? In Rio de Janeiro. And this is one of the things he said down there, quote, Current lifestyles and consumption patterns of the affluent middle class involving high meat intake, use of fossil fuels, appliances, home and work air conditioning, and suburban, suburban housing are not sustainable. In other words, he can jet set around the world as the multimillionaire that he is and live in beautiful air conditioned homes and have his and, own bodyguards and ha you, yeah. you bet and tr travel in the best of cars with air conditioning and on the greatest of jet airliners and so on but the rest of us are not going to be able to sustain that pattern of consumption to give everybody a little better idea of agenda 21 let me let me read one more quote now this is from agenda 21 and I think this really helps you. Uh, how much time do we have? Oh, we've got about 12 minutes. We're good oh, okay. to go. Oh, okay, good. Well, I think this really helps uh, those that are viewing this program to understand kind of what the goals of Agenda 21 are. So think of these as United Nations goals. Okay. Let, let me ask and, you this, Bliss. Yeah. <clears throat> do you believe that we, we're kind of past the point of rescue or we're way behind the power curve and trying to get the word out to everybody out there <laughs> This is some real stuff. This ain't conspiracy stuff. Well, I, I do think that, you know, the John Birch Society brought this, this information out in 1992, and we have struggled to warn America and have them be receptive to our warnings. But I think that you've probably seen since about 2008 a new awakening in America, not just the youth, but even those who have been I guess, uh, kind of stuck in their ways. Or naive. Or naive. Yeah. And there's a new awakening and a new acceptance. I think that the internet has helped with that because there's been access to information that a controlled media didn't really, didn't really make available. And instead of just hearing the uh, views that we're supposed to hear, uh, we're actually able to dig in and share with each other in a more of a free uh, press environment over the internet, and I think that that's helped grow um, a greater awareness of truths that were s sort of hidden. Well, aren't they, I mean, I don't know if Agenda 21 falls, in, but they're trying to control the internet right now. Well, know? there's a desire uh, by those uh, that are working to overcome freedom and build a new world order, a global government. There's a desire to put the internet under control of the United Nations so that it can be censored. Well. <clears throat> Haven't you seen that in Red China? Oh, yeah. I that, used the word red. Oh, my goodness, yeah, we used the word red. Is that, is that politically correct? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, people forget that the communist Chinese uh, Chinese Communist Party's Politburo rules China, and so I still call it Red China because the Red Communists still rule. I've got no problem with that. <laughs> Actually, we've got, from what I understand, we've got a lot of Agenda 21 operations right now here in Idaho. Sure, I, I like to call uh, the environmental movement to the watermelon movement, uh, and that's not something I made up. It's green on the outside and red on the inside. It has a socialist core, <laughs> world socialism. That's pretty good. <laughs> so let me read this one quote. This will give you a better idea. This comes from Agenda 21, okay, and this goes to kind of the whole view of what's the relationship of the UN and Agenda 21 to just normal human beings all over the world. Quote, effective execution of Agenda 21 will require a profound reorientation of all human society, unlike anything the world has ever experienced, a major shift in the priorities of both governments and individuals, and an unprecedented redeployment of human and financial resources. This shift will demand that a concern for the environmental consequences of every human action be integrated into individual and collective decision-making at every level. So, end quote. 
So this is talking about central planning that requires all of us to kowtow to, to bow down to, and to incorporate into our every thought process and every action. You know, you're gonna cook breakfast, you've gotta think of how it's gonna affect the environment. <clears throat> now I've got a little timeline here, if you don't mind, that I can go through some of these reports in a step-by-step -step fashion just to show you the direction that we're moving in, in promoting the sustainable development model of Agenda 21. I mentioned 1987, the Brundtland Commission, chaired by Gro Harlem Brundtland, Vice President of the World Socialist uh, Party, put together the Brundtland Commission report, where the idea of sustainable development was introduced. 1992, we had the uh, Security General of the United Nations, Maurice Strong, who was a staunch supporter and current resident of Communist China, uh, chair that UN Earth Summit down there. 1992, the Earth Summit brought us out Agenda 21. 1992, Agenda 21 was signed by 178 world leaders, including President George Herbert Walker Bush. 1993, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12852, which established the President's Council on Sustainable Development as an implementation effort towards implementing Agenda 21. Even though the U.S. Senate hadn't passed Agenda 21 as a treaty, it was still going to go ahead and be implemented. Through a backdoor process. By the executive like a backdoor branch. Uh, like you're doing through all these exo exo executive orders. Exactly. Yeah. And, and we don't see the president authorized to legislate. Congress has Congress the correct. authority to legislate. But, presidents but we are, seem to forget that, don't we? We well, seem to forget that Americans today. who don't study their constitution forget that. That's correct. There's an ignorance there for many Americans that they need to rectify by learning about their constitution so that they can hold elected officials from the president to their U.S. senators to their U.S. representatives accountable to the supreme law of the land. Well, how, the, how they got things going today is they're, they're making it all everybody out there, well not everyone, but majority of people out there probably saying, well, this is correct, they don't, they don't research you. Please, guys, research your Constitution. Anyways. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so President Clinton established in 1993 through Executive Order 12852 the President's Council on Sustainable Development. So we're moving forward with that. 2011, President Barack Obama signed Executive Order 13575, which established the White House Rural Council. What, what is the White House Rural Council? Well, again, this is... I mean, we can make up names yeah. all day. This is a, another what? council that's going to be looking at those in rural communities. How can we help them? How can government help them to uh, implement sustainable development in their rural communities? Uh, I look at the great help government's given to Idaho, Idaho for establishing, you know, better relations with... Uh, the gray wolf, for example, you know, they've brought in all these gray wolf packs to eat all of your um, lambs and cattle. Yeah, and, and all <laughs> of the ungulates, you know, your elk, your deer, your moose mm -hmm. populations are just dwindling because thanks to this wildlands project viewpoint, we've got to bring these wolves in, even though they're not indigenous no. to uh, Idaho. They, they're imported from Canada. So are you saying the government's pushing stuff on us? I'm sure saying that. <laughs> Um, so you want to look in your cities for the catchphrases like sustainable development, smart growth, resilient cities, all the different green initiatives. These are brought in by facilitators into your cities. I, I printed off and I brought it with me, I, I believe I've got here. If, if you get this little pamphlet from the John Birch Society, on the back side it will show you how to reach into the website of ICLEI, okay, this is I-C-L-E-I dot org, I-C-L-E-I dot org. So you go into the ICLEI website, and let me tell you what ICLEI is before I tell you about it. Um, <coughs> ICLEI, They're bad news. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I, ICLEI is a, an acronym that stands for the International Council on, um, let me see here. I don't have it. International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. Now that was their first name and uh, they came out uh, as a NGO, a non-governmental organization approved by the United Nations, really to, to help implement